All right, brothers and sisters, as we talked about before, we are continuing our series about waiting. What are you waiting for? And today we are talking from Joel chapter 3, Joel chapter 3, verses 17 to 21. And Joel is one of the minor prophets, remembering, of course, that minor doesn't mean unimportant. It just means that what we have that is written by them or about them is small, um, not unimportant. Joel is, uh, is, is going to speak to us about blessings for God's people. Just before this, he had been uh, doling out on behalf of the Lord who commanded him to do so, uh, judgments against the various nations around Israel and Judah. And so now we are hearing about the blessings that God will have for His people. He says this, Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacias. But Egypt will be desolate. Edom, a desert waste because of violence done to the people of Judah in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem through all generations Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, there are things that we need to point out about this passage before we go too much farther in it. Uh, first of all, we need to remind ourselves that Zion and Judah are, um, they are synonymous in a lot of ways. Uh, you see, what happened is that when Israel, when the people of Israel and Judah came into the promised land in the first place, they had to, as you remember from uh, Joshua and Judges, uh, they had to sort of cleanse the land in order to claim it for themselves. And it took them quite a while to do that with the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it was uh, called Jebus, and it was the city of the Jebusites. And for a long time, it remained a city of the Jebusites until eventually they were able to conquer the city of Jerusalem, and it was made eventually into the capital city of Israel and Judah. And it was also... Uh, the, the dwelling place of God in the temple. The temple that Solomon built. And then throughout the generations succeeding that, um, Jerusalem became more and more symbolic of not just the capital city of Israel and Judah in a, in a, in a concrete political sort of way, but it became more and more symbolic of the idealized city of God, the holy dwelling place of God, right? When, when you look in the Scriptures and you read in the Psalms and you hear about a song of ascent or, or songs like that, you've you got to picture yourself singing this as it were as you're coming into Jerusalem and Jerusalem is is on a hill and there's valleys around it and, and you're 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 both literally ascending into the city of Jerusalem heading towards the temple but you are also uh, spiritually ascending into the presence of God and, and this this symbolism continues throughout the rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament so that by the time we get to John's revelation, the new Jerusalem which descends out of heaven in which God dwells, we are told, is adorned as a bride for her groom. 
And this is very interesting. This is very interesting because there we suddenly have the picture and it's not, it's not completely isolated. If we paid attention, we could see it elsewhere. But we see that Jerusalem has become not only symbolic of God's dwelling place, but it has become symbolic in a way of God's people. Right? Because what is the relationship of Christ and the church? It is the relationship of the groom and the bride. And so when we see in Revelation the city of Jerusalem adorned as a bride, A, that if we don't pay attention, that's a really nonsensical image, right? We, we don't see cities falling from heaven dressed as a bride. That would be weird, right? But we understand that this is a picture of Jerusalem being the church and the church being Jerusalem and the bride of Christ. And so this is, this is difficult because it's very, very entirely possible that there is a literal city of God that descends from heaven. But it's also true that this city is somehow symbolically connected with us as the people of God. And Jerusalem is the holy dwelling place of God. And so we see Jerusalem descending out of heaven, and we know that that means Jerusalem, that that means Zion, that that means the holy hill, that that means the bride of Christ, that that means you and I, that that means God's holy people. And so we can see as we follow in Joel chapter 3, verses 17 to 21, that there's a lot of other symbolism there mixed in with real life stuff, right? Notice it says that God will dwell in Zion, his holy hill, and Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her, right? Because sadly, that was a reality for Jerusalem and has been a reality for Jerusalem for many, 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 many years. So many years. So many empires. So many battles. So many people invading that place. And that's partly because Jerusalem has a, a strategic place in the Middle East where many of these battles and powers were fighting for control, right? You've got Egypt just sort of to the, the southwest, and you've got places like Babylon and Assyria and so on that are sort of slightly north and east, right? And then you've got Rome, which is over to the northwest or west-northwest, and, and Greece, of course, before them. And, and all of these empires flow through there because of its strategic location. But God says, never again will foreigners invade her. And, and we know that that is not just a geopolitical reality, but rather that is also a promise about how our lives will be in the new Jerusalem. What our reality will be like. Never again will the enemy invade her. And then we go on to this picture, this picture that Joel is seeking to paint through the words of the Lord of satisfaction. And satisfaction is such a difficult thing to paint because what does satisfaction look like? Right In some ways, that old song by the Rolling Stones is the correct way to look at things, right? That song, okay, is anybody young enough that they don't know who the Rolling Stones are? Because that would be sad. Yeah, everybody knows who the Rolling Stones are. Oh, whew, okay, you don't have to like the Rolling Stones, but you should know who they are. But there's a, that classic song, Can't Get No Satisfaction. That's not the proper title, but you know how it goes. Can't get no satisfaction. 
I'm totally a rock and roll star, obviously, right? And, and they're, they're right in a lot of ways. I mean, this is a rock and roll band among rock and roll bands. They have the wealth and the, the travel and the experience to try to find satisfaction in pretty much anything you could possibly think of. They want to find satisfaction in drink, no problem. Drugs, no problem. Money, they got it. Find satisfaction in meeting lots of powerful and influential people People, no problem. Want to have satisfaction from a career that spans decades miraculously even in spite of the abuse they have done to themselves? Yep, got that. Want satisfaction from, from foods? No problem. Want satisfaction from women? No problem. Satisfaction wherever they go except not. Except not. They can't get no satisfaction. But the truth is, is that even though we don't have the wealth or the power or the influence of a band like the Rolling Stones, we do the same thing, don't we? We try and fill our lives and satisfy ourselves with all kinds of things. <laughs> Think of the golfer. I know there are a few people who go golfing around here. Uh, some of them go regularly. It's good. You ever have a really good shot? Like a, just an amazing shot? <laughs> That's reality calling saying no. <laughs> Right, um, you know, every once in a while, this is what my this this used to drive my dad nuts. He would go golfing like every weekend, and and he would get so angry. And I'd be like, Dad, why do you go golfing? Why are you golfing? You hate it. You get so mad. He'd say, But yeah, but th- every once in a while, there's that that shot, that putt, that that hole, that just oh, it's so good. Right? And so he chases after that. And he just gets so mad. He eventually quit because of golfer's elbow, but I think it was really, he realized he wasn't getting no satisfaction. So, right? It's, it's just not satisfying. And that's true for all of these things that we chase after. It's true even even if we're pinning our hopes for satisfaction on our spouse or our children or our parents, right? The reality is is that they too are going to disappoint at some time. They too, if, if we're hanging our hopes on them, are not going to satisfy. Not because your spouse or your parents or or your children are such terrible, disappointing people, but because they're not the right places, they're not the right people to get satisfaction from. Right? Blaise Pascal said that there is a God-shaped hole in everyone's heart. I'm paraphrasing. He's right. You can try and fill it with all kinds of things. You can try and fill it with some of the things that, that, the, that Joel tries to use to describe satisfaction. You can try and fill it with new wine and milk and running water and fountains and, and so on. You can try and fill it with those things, but it's not going to work. You're not going to do it because there's only one thing, one being who can fill the void. And that is the Lord our God. And that is why 
though Joel seeks to paint this picture, right? He says, in that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water, right? This is an arid, arid place. It's a dry place. But then it will flow, run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of, of, of Acacias. And then it goes on, it talks about Edom and Egypt and the consequences of their violence. And then it goes back to Judah. Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem through all generations. Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. And then the conclusion, the biggest, the most important thing, the most important thing, the thing that truly satisfies is the same thing that Joel talks about in the beginning. The Lord dwells in Zion. That's why those bookends are there. Verse 17, Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill, Jerusalem will be holy. And in the end, the Lord dwells in Zion because those are the bookends. Those are the important points. That's the reality. That's where the satisfaction comes from. And so what are we waiting for? We are waiting for satisfaction. And we are waiting. We are already not yet satisfied. We are already satisfied in the sense that Jesus already came and He already lived among us. He became one of us. And He lived and He walked with us and He taught us and He healed us. And He died for us and He rose again for us. The firstborn, the first fruits of what we will be. And we've been adopted into His family and we are His co-heirs we are brothers and sisters of Jesus and we are we are the children of God and then further than that we have been given the Holy Spirit to live within us so that the, the dwelling of God is already here we are the holy temple and so we are already satisfied and yet the scriptures also tell us that we do not see fully clearly what we will be. That we can see as through a glass darkly. And that someday, we will dwell with God face to face. Walking and talking with Him in the cool of the garden in the new Jerusalem. (laughs) Then, that God-shaped hole is fully and finally filled. Completely in every sense of the word. And so this Advent season, we are Waiting for satisfaction. We are both retroactively waiting for the satisfaction of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, but we are also waiting for the final and complete satisfaction, the revealing of who we truly are as God's children resurrected through His power and given eternal life through His grace and love. What do you do with that? What's the practical reality? I struggle with practical reality sometimes. For me, uh, for me, a, a big idea, well, of course it's practical. That's just, that's just the way my brain works. And so sometimes I have problem putting legs on things. But the reality is, is that often, and, and this I was taught in seminary, if, if, if it feels sometimes like you're preaching the same message over and over again, that could be a really good thing. Because the gospel is the gospel is the gospel. 
And if so, you're going some weird direction and it's like, whoa, never heard that before. That might be an indication of problems. The reality is is that the Gospel is the Gospel is the Gospel. And so this Advent good news of being satisfied is a call to us to live in that reality ourselves. To live in the reality that I am satisfied by Jesus and not by electronic doodads or wine or women or men or or anything else on this earth, but I am satisfied by God alone. But then it is also a call to share that good news. That's what Jesus says. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and throughout the whole world. What's the point if we keep the good news all to ourselves? It's like those customer experience surveys, right? Every time. It's funny, right? You call, you call like the most disappointing business in the universe. I have an HP laptop. I like the laptop. I hate their customer service. Sorry, HP. It's terrible, right? So I call them and I ask them for help. And I'm on the phone for like a million hours and finally get to talk to a human being and the human being tells me stuff I already know. And I say, why don't you elevate me to step two, tech support? Well, sir, we got to go through this. By the way, you're probably a moron. And then I say, give me the proper tech support. And then finally they say, oh, that's a software problem. It's not our issue. (laughs) And I say, And then they have the gall to send me a survey afterwards that says, based on your interaction, how satisfied are you? (laughs) And how likely are you to recommend us to someone else? Obviously not very likely. (laughs) Right? But think about this. If you are satisfied, really truly satisfied, then you're going to be likely to recommend it to somebody else. Right? If I am truly satisfied with the salvation that Jesus Christ my Lord has given me and all that that encompasses, then why would I keep my mouth shut? My friends, my neighbors, oh, my life just seems so meaningless. I just don't know where I'm going in life. What's the point? Why bother? Man, I thought that job was really good, but now it's turned out to be a disaster. Oh man, I've been drinking for years. And now it's just a a habit. And I can't stop. They're not satisfied. So let's share with them our satisfaction. What are you waiting for? The satisfaction that I already have and yet will have. The satisfaction that I can share now with my neighbors and the hope of greater satisfaction to be realized in the future. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank You, O God, that Your promise through the prophet Joel that the people of Jerusalem and Judah will be satisfied. Thank You that that promise is also a promise for us. Thank You, O Lord, for sending Your Son, Jesus, in response to this promise. And thank You so very much for the satisfaction You have already given us beyond what we could ever hope or imagine or dream and certainly far beyond what we deserve. 
And Lord, thank You for the satisfaction yet to come. May we, O oh God, may we share that satisfaction with all of those around us. Not just at this Christmas season, but also throughout the year. May we never forget that we can have satisfaction. We do have satisfaction. And so too, our neighbors can have satisfaction as well. Bless us, O oh God, to be Your witnesses and Your messengers in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.